Dear participants of Polish American Innovation Bridge, welcome to our keynote speech today. Uh, our guest is Asmai Jizu, who founded and uh, uh, is the CEO of Inceptima, a company that is uh, popularizing uh, ESG, so environmental and social uh, corporate governmental. Uh, it's a way of measuring a success of a uh, company or organization, uh, not focused on just financial uh, results, but with long-term view uh, for environmental impact and social impact. Uh, thank you, Asma, for joining us. Uh, for you, it's a Thanksgiving morning, uh, because Asma is uh, uh, connected to us just directly from USA. And uh, please share with us your thoughts, your experiences uh, from your uh, uh, day to day job uh, with international and global organizations. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Jan. Thank you so much for having me here today. Um, as Jan said, it's Thanksgiving morning here. So we're all very tired from last night's preparation and looking forward to the rest of the day. But um, it's, it's a pleasure for me to join you today. I, I really get excited when. It's time to talk about climate change or environmental and social governance. And um, <clears throat> it's something that I'm very passionate about. I'm the CEO of Inceptima. Uh, really, we started out as a program management company, but became really passionate about the environment and uh, social impact. And so <clears throat> recently, in the past few years, we've been really working on educating everyone that we can get our hands on to really understand the impact of climate change and um, the impact of, of, of being socially alert and having to really spread this type of knowledge throughout the globe. So thank you very much again for having me today. I'm, I'm really excited about that. <clears throat> so what really is environmental and social corporate governance? Um, when you look at a company, for instance, there are certain criteria that you can use to measure how environmentally and socially uh, inert they are. So basically, environmental governance so and social corporate governance looks at a certain uh, number of criteria um, from the environmental standpoint, for instance, are, is this company, um, you know, are they going green? Do they practice, um, <clears throat> you know, eco friendly? Uh, do they take eco friendly measures within their company? You know, what sort of eco friendly measures do they take? How is that contributing to their overall? Net, you know, net zero um, 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 sustainable development goals. And so th those are the environmental factors that you look at. And then you have social factors, right? Social factors that deal with community, that deal with how people interact with each other within that um, company. Um, you know, how do they interact? Are the employees happy? Um, is there, uh, you know, uh, is there a, a good level of equality there? And so those are the things that we look at when you talk about social impact <clears throat> and also you know what is that company doing to contribute to the, the community to their society to the world in general you know what what are they doing to um to meet social social mandates and then you have you know governance which really moves up to leadership you know how is that company how does their leadership structure uh, is it a good leadership structure is it a friendly leadership leadership structure that promotes um diversity, equality, growth, um, uh, financial um, support, you know, th those are the type of things that you look at. So, so when we say, in, you know, ESG investing, we're not just saying financial investment in environmental and social corporate governance issues, but we're saying, you know, social investment, um, governance investment, you know, leadership investment, different types of investment is not just focused on um, on, on money. It's not just monetary, right? So, so today we're kind of going to, you know, Tom, I'm just going to share with you a part of ESG that, it, you know, we feel, you know, here at Inceptima, we feel that is really lacking. And, and, and if, in, you know, globally, and if we focus on these elements, um, you know, within different organizations, we can improve, uh, first of all, uh, people's awareness level, when it comes to, um, you know, environmental and social impact issues, increase their participation and increase partnership, global partnership, 
um, and also educate people about what they can do as individuals to really contribute to um, you know, the, the climate change issues that we're having today. So um, please, if you can just go to, so I'm just gonna cover like four major areas, which is you know, on the understanding of climate change impact um, and what it really is, you know, the impact and how it impacts us today. I'm also going to cover um, Decentech, which is decentralized technology and how that can contribute to a better environment. Um, I'm gonna just go over a few environmental mandates just to talk about um, the current mandates that we have right now globally and how that impacts everyone. And then finally, I'm just gonna you know, end it with an action plan to say, you know, I just don't wanna leave and just, I don't wanna come here and, and talk about these things without having you know, some kind of action plan for, for you to take back with you and you know, think through and, and decide, okay, you know, what, what do we do next basically? So please, if, if you can just share the, the next, do I share the next slide myself or are you guys sharing the next slide for me? <laughs> Okay, maybe I have to share it myself. Okay, so here I talk about, you know, you know, I don't know if you guys are familiar with the 17 Sustainable Development Goals. Um, and these are goals that were developed by the United Nations um, a few years ago to really tackle a lot of the world's major problems, you know, where, where you have to, to, you know, the first one, for instance, being a no poverty, um, to eliminate poverty around the world, um, you know, through zero hunger. Number two is zero hunger. Basically, you know, no one left behind, you know, no one should be hungry in this age and time. Um, promoting good health and well-being is number three, of course, through, through good health care, um, quality education, gender equality, clean water and sanitation. And the reason why I'm going through these development goals is because they're kind of all tied to environmental and social corporate governance, right? All these issues with environment, you know, gender equalities for social, for instance, health, um, and then and then governance, of course, partnerships, number 17, partnerships for the goals, um, peace, justice, and strong institutions is number 16. Um, so, so all these sustainable development goals pretty much tie into environmental and social corporate governance and really, you know, it tells us one message, one great message, that message being, you know, what we need to do as a community, what we need to do as people to really help the environment and really help the, the world in general get to where it needs to be within, um, you know, the next 20, 30 years. So I really want to kind of talk about, you know, I think, you know, currently we're not, um, re we're aware of climate change. A lot of people are aware of climate change, but I think the level of severity is not really uh, expressed enough for people to take it seriously. And so there's, uh, there's some things that I think, you know, we, we should shed light on. Um, and, and three of the, the sustainable development goals which fall under you know, uh, climate change for us, of course, is climate action, which is number 13, uh, life below water, which is number 14, and life on land, which is number 15. So, so these, these development goals, of course, are very important. So there are three, three major areas of climate change impact that, you know, I like to just focus. There are others, but I like to focus on these three. Um, and these three being um, ecological, societal and economic. So when we say ecological, we mean floods, you know, desertification. I know you've, you know, recently seen, um, or we've experienced recently in the past few months, uh, funny weather changes. We had one here, we had one, we had the snowstorm in, um, in Texas. And then we also had, you know, I know there was an issue in Germany not too long ago, which dealt with, uh, you know, we had the flooding there. So we are, you know, we've, we've been seeing the past few years, we're continue to see, we're continuing to see, you know, patterns and trends in uh, the weather changes and how that's seriously impacting everybody. Um, and, and these weather changes, of course, our infrastructure, you know, if you think about it, our infrastructure was not built in a way to withstand, you know, these terrible disasters. 
And so if we continue to have these disasters, floods and desertification, hurricanes, you know, all sorts of things, snowstorms, you know, we, you know, eventually the, the rate of human migration from one place to another and, um, you know, uh, homelessness is going to increase, of course. So you have that, that is a major problem. From the societal perspective, of course, climate migration, which I just mentioned, um, the more, you know, ecological uh, impacts that we have, there will be an increase in societal issues. So when people are moving from one place to another, people are becoming homeless, um, you know, infrastructural problems. So, you know, health and diseases, when you have infrastructural problems, you know, you have broken pipes, you have flooding, you have dirty water, all kinds of things that leads to diseases. So, you know, again, looking at it from a holistic perspective, climate change impact is really huge and it's really serious. Um, and I think, you know, from a general perspective, knowing that the, the world just does not know enough and does not do enough about it. So these are the things that we need to understand, you know, how is it gonna affect you as an individual? Um, economic supply chain disruption is a third impact. Um, for instance, you know, if there is a, a major disaster somewhere, there will be, for instance, flooding, roads will be impacted, transportation will therefore be impacted, and the move of goods from one place to another, goods and services, uh, is, is going to be disrupted. So you're going to have, uh, you know, disruption in, um, in movement of, of, of supplies. So that's, that's the third um, economic impact that, you know, people kind of need to, to pay attention to. Um, <clears throat> also, I think it's good to understand, again, you know, from a very realistic perspective, uh, what does this impact mean? Okay, so let's focus on one major commodity that everybody, almost everybody in the world consumes, right? Coffee, right? So, so up to 70%, 75% uh, of Uganda's coffee uh, is expected to decrease because of climate change, because of the change in the weather. Um, you know, these crops can only grow in a certain climate. And the more there's a change in the climate, it's gonna impact uh, the growth of these crops. So there's potentially gonna be a loss of 25% suitable land for you know, Arabica coffee and, and decline in the overall yield. You know? So that's, that's definitely a major issue. Talking about migration as well, which we covered earlier, um, you know, a one to 23% ratio where you have from rural to urban or from conflict zones, um, people moving from one place to another. For an, give an example, with the flooding that happened in Germany, I'm you know sure that a lot of people had to to leave their homes and move from one. They were displ displaced, and so they had to move from one place to another. So that that's that's an issue. Um, so that's you know from a realistic perspective, uh, what what we're trying to to relay here. So. Now that we, we've gone over like climate change impact and, you know, from a personal angle, we understand, you know, how potentially strawberries and avocados and cocoa and chocolate, you know, can be impacted. Like you, you don't want to go into the store one day and realize, oh, they don't have any chocolate. But why? What happened? Yeah, because the supply chain has been disrupted because of weather problems. So we, we don't want to have that um, in, in the near future. And so these things are very important to kind of pay attention to, I think. Now, so now that we know what the impact of climate change is, how can we mitigate it? How can we help um, as individuals or as companies? Uh, how can we form partnerships to help? Um, one area that we like to highlight uh, as a solution, of course, is decentralized technologies. So decentralized technologies are basically uh, technologies that can work without being connected to a grid, a power grid, or being connected to anything. The only thing that we would be connected to as a decentralized technology would be, of course, the internet, which is widely available um, in, in most places, but except the rural areas, of course, but these days people are coming up with different types of solutions. Um, so, so decentralized technologies are really technologies that produce uh, power or technologies that provide data or technologies that, um, you know, monitor or technologies that are just completely disconnected from a grid. They're independent technologies. They can be easily set up. Some of them are used to remove carbon from the air. Some of them are used to trace um, um, 
you know, a, a, a data pattern, a weather, weather patterns, right, um, and collect data. So, so decentralized technologies cover a, a very wide array of technologies, including renewable energy technologies, software, um, and even equipment, right? But they're, they're very independent and they're disconnected from grids. So talking about decentralized technologies, um, as our world becomes increasingly digital, of course, with the data, you know, big data, the internet of things, um, you know, so do the solutions to our environmental problems, right? So we are moving towards a digital world where everything is digital. So what is decentralized technology? Um, you know, solar panels on microgrids versus massive power plants with poles. Again, you know, like I mentioned earlier, these are technologies that do not need a huge infrastructure or investment, uh, invested capital to, to, to operate. You know, they're technologies that are very, very disconnected from anything. Um, they're very independent technologies. And, and, and that's where we're moving towards, right? And if you look at the sustainable goals that are attached to, to this, this particular technologies, affordable and clean energy, one of the best ways to provide affordable and clean energy, um, and, and everybody's working on that right now, is, is through renewable energy solutions, which are mostly decentralized technologies because most of them use solar power, right? So you have, you have solar power, for, you know, and the role of decent tech in saving the climate as a decarbonization tool, uh, these days you have a lot of you know companies and organizations developing power plant, not power plants, but sorry, carbon plants where they're sucking out the carbon from the air. Um, and so I know there's some some of them that exist today. I think one in, in either Sweden or Switzerland. Um, and so these technologies provide modular solutions to massive climatological and ecological challenges. Right, they improve the quality and availability of env environmental information, and they facilitate grassroots community engagement through activism. Right, so basically, these technologies help us um, and make our lives easier to to collect data, understand um, climatic trends, and also provide solutions. Uh, in areas that have absolutely nothing, right? So, so these are the perfect solution for um, producing power. For instance, in a rural area that does not have internet, it's not connected to the internet, they have no power wires, they are disconnected from everything. You can go set up a solar plant in that remote, you know, rural area and produce electricity. And that's what makes these technologies so important and so great is because they can they can do things uh, without having to depend on a massive infrastructure. So some of some examples, like <clears throat> real examples of, of decentralized technologies, you know, are, are for instance, we'll talk about ID Box, right? So so ID Box is really a solar powered digital identity and virtual wallet device deployed by, by you and women, right? So it's, it's basically a device that um, that's powered by the sun and it, it produces data, right? And you also have uh, distributed energy generation and charging stations, you know, block charge is one of them. And it's, it's basically a blockchain based um, pair to pair platform for supporting uh, electric vehicle charging, right? So now that we're a lot of people transitioning to electric vehicles, um, you know, I, and I'll personally say in my area, we don't have many charging stations, but I think, uh, it's, it's something that, you know, as, as the number of electric vehicles increase, uh, the demand for, uh, block charge is going to increase as well. So hopefully in the future, in the near future, we're going to see more, more coming from block charge. Um, <clears throat> we also have, uh, IBM plastic bank. So IBM developed a plastic bag that is really um, used for pollution abatement and control. And it's, it's basically a platform allowing for plastic to be collected and traded in, in for digital currency. So you can, you can trade your plastic in and, and get you know, Bitcoin. So that's, that's a really advanced um, and interesting uh, technology that we wanted to share. And then you, know, you also have the small scale renewables with the solar, wind, 
biomass, microgrid technology, and of course, smart meters. These are all um, decentralized renewable energy solutions that produce electricity on different levels from large scale production to small scale production, depending on the type of solutions that, that, that are selected. So now that you know we've covered climate change impact, um, we understand what climate change impact is. Of course, we've talked about um, the diff, you know one of the solutions, centralized technologies. Um, another point that we want to drive here that uh, we again we feel is not you know are, they're not taken as, as seriously they should be taken you know by by the world in general is is the environmental mandates right that that we're trying to get to by 2050. So not only is the climate changing, not only do we have solutions, but there's also laws and policies in place right now and are being put, you know, put in place right now. Uh, you know, if you talk about COP26 that just happened in Glasgow, that was a huge event that's focused on, on policies surrounding the environment. And, and, and these are all mandates that are being put in place and being discussed and will be put in place in the next few years that will impact every single individual in, in different countries. And so they're all towards a net zero, you know, emission uh, by 2030. So some of these <clears throat> include, um, you know, the UNFCCC Paris Agreement, of course. Um, you know, when Article Two talks about, uh, you know, trying to get, you know, the environment below two degrees centigrade, and the goal is is 1.5 degrees centigrade. Now, are we close to that, <laughs> according to the, you know, to, the, to COP26? No. <laughs> so, so we have a lot of work to do. You know, it's Article 4 that talks about mitigation of, of, of climate um, change uh, activities and also adaptation. Um, and so these are all the articles that are just being, you know, laid out here. And Article 12, which talks about training, you know, training because uh, a lot of people do not understand, again, the uh, impacts, uh, environmental impacts of, of climate change. And so training is also a very, very big um, part of this, and it's under the Paris Agreement. We also have Sustainable Development Goals, the SDGs, you know, the 2030 towards, you know, trying, and I think we went over that in the beginning, trying to really um, achieve and overachieve these SDGs. We also have policy and regula regulatory changes, of course, and um, every country is different. For instance, I know in the UK, you know, they're going towards a, a more electric, you know, vehicle friendly um, uh, transportation system. And, you know, you know, penalties and taxes are being applied to the use of roads in certain areas, um, you know, that that uh, the use of roads with regular cars that are producing carbon. So, you know, countries like Switzerland are, are building plants to 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 suck out the carbon in the air, um, you know. So, so there's different types of, you know, here in the U.S. So we have like companies that are actually producing fuels from from coffee, um, from leftover coffee. So, you know, so from, so 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 th those are the things that I think, you know, different countries have different um, activities that they're doing. And so, we, you know, when you talk about policy and regulatory regulatory changes, we talk about, you know, litigation for requiring decarbonization. Um, financial penalties of fossil fuels use as a big thing um, <clears throat> and we just talked about climate justice initiatives you know like um, a, a lot of these climate justice initiatives really you know are focused on trying not to you know um, to to eliminate you know capturing animals in different parts of the world and animals that are going extinct or um, you know cutting down of trees um, to limit that you know or even a, a completely eliminate it um, you also have like carbon tax implementation, like I just mentioned in the UK, that that there are certain implement you know tax Im Im implications for um, producing carbon, and and basically trying to create more ESG focused investments. I think, and so all these all these mandates are going to be trickling down and are you know currently being implemented. Um, and, and just to give an example, <clears throat> there is, uh, you know, we can focus on Uganda again, because Uganda is, is, is in a hot spot in Africa. Um, you know, U Uganda's climate change, for instance, you know, they have uh, the NDC and NAP. It's basically an adaptation for agriculture, infrastructure and energy. 
water, forestry, and, and so forth, and mitigation and cross-cutting. So these these uh, policies being put in place to um, to to you know support climate change impacts, and they also have the national climate policy that was you know created in 2015. Um, you also have the Sustainable Development Goals, this goal number seven and 15, which is basically to ensure access to affordable, reliable energy and to protect, restore, and promote sustainable use of, you know, terrestrial ecosystems, um, may, basically forest, you know, management and to combat desertification by reducing the, the cutting down of trees. So, so those are some things that, for instance, Uganda, one country, just to focus on in Africa, that's, that's doing um, in terms of, you know, environmental and social corporate governance um, um, policies. Again, talking about environmental mandates, you know, talking from home here, you know, in the United States, you know, United States, of course, is, is also doing a lot of things to, uh, to help with, you know, the, the climate change um, situation as well. You know, the, the Biden administration joined the Paris Agreement uh, early this year. And, you know, one of our priorities here is carbon free power sector by 2035 and, you know, reduction um, uh, of greenhouse gases, by, you know, from, by 50 to 52 percent. It's a huge goal, but, you know, we're hoping to get there. And so these are, again, some of the, the, the subnational initiatives like carbon trading schemes um, and, and, you know, coalitions like the U.S. Climate Alliance. And so, so those are some of the mandates that... Um, here in the U.S., we are we're, we're looking at and we're working on. So now that you know we've we've talked about again climate change impact, decentralized technologies, you know, which is a solution, one of the many solutions, and we've we've talked about um, the mandates that are attached to all these um, issues, um, you know. What next, right? What what's going to happen, right? So, okay, so now that we know about climate change impact, what can I do as an individual? And I tell people, you know, from from the the, the smallest things to the the biggest things, you know, it it starts with like, you know, making sure that you're separating your glass bottles. I I personally on a personal level, I I recycle my glass bottles every you know twice a month, and and I and I go off and I and I go to the recycling plant and I have to drop it off there. It's a painful process because they don't pick it up from my house, but Again, um, it's that one little contribution that you can make as an individual to um, to help, right? So, so what what think about it? What am I doing as an individual to uh, impact the climate in a, in a positive way? And so, um, you know, the next thing is to really have an action plan. Again, and it does not have to be on a corporate level; it can be on a personal level, or it can be in a corporate level, right? But what is your action plan? Um, to to really uh, help the situation, right? And 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 then again, we're focused on decentralized technology, but it's not the only way. And there are other ways to do it, like I just mentioned on a personal level. So, but how can decent tech help us move forward into a sustainable climate future? So we have a four we have four steps. We develop four steps here that that we go through. So the first step is really to conduct the climate change impact vulnerability assessment on yourself or your company, right? We have to do an assessment. Then this assessment is just kind of like a set of questions you have to ask yourself. And again, uh, these also fall into the line of ESG um, criteria for investment. So if if uh, if you were looked at as a company that needs to be invested in terms of ESG, you know, investors would be looking at they would assess you from an environmental, social, and corporate governance level. And part of that assessment is certain number of questions that have to be answered. Um, and, and, and that also ties into your vulnerability assessment. You know, how vulnerable are you as a company? Um, you know, and, and, and some of these questions are, do you recycle your paper? Do you buy um, eco-friendly paper? Um, do you recycle your plastics? Uh, are your employees aware of uh, the impact of climate change? Do you have a training that you conduct within your company? So those are the type of assessments, questions that would come up for an assessment. Um, the second step would be to develop a workshop or uh, an, a climate change, you know, based on the results of your assessment, depending on how 
you know, well aligned you are with climate change goals or not, you would have to go through some kind of change, right, for the better. And, and part of that change is the development of an adaptation toolkit where you can really uh, look at all the steps that you can take to become eco-friendly or to be more climate change aware. And so that toolkit can be developed and that can be something that you can then go to step three, train yourself or your, your staff on um, how to become uh, eco-friendly. And basically that training would lead to measurable outcomes, right? So I wanna say, okay, uh, in the beginning I started, you know, I, I never used to recycle my paper. I would just shred it. But now um, we recycle our paper and we use about, I don't know, 10,000 pages per month um, and and now we're and now we're recycling ten thousand pages or maybe five thousand pages per month. And so these 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 uh, these steps need to be measurable um, because at the end of the day, when it comes to ESG, you have to be able to say what you've done or what you're doing um, for your company or yourself to to be aligned with climate change impact goals, right? And and finally, you know, step four is really a follow on from step three. And just, just really advocating, um, you know, climate change impact and advocating environmental um, and, and social and corporate governance. So, so they all kind of tie in together. And and when we talk about um, advocating, right? There's there's also an element of social impact there. And I think you know that kind of brings me to, um, you know, the next thing that I was trying to get to initially from the beginning. Which, which is, you know, social impact. I think we don't talk about it enough. Um, so social impact um, is really what you can do on a community level um, with partnerships um, to address, uh, you know, um, climate change impact issues. So we have, how do we interact with companies on a social level? How do we create a social, uh, social awareness within our community towards climate change impact? And how can we create global partnerships through that? And I think one major element is being able to, to be, first of all, be aware of the impacts of climate change and being able to take that seriously as it is right now, you know, the world is taking it to a different level. So are you able to talk to companies to collaborate with you um, towards a, a social impact friendly community. And so I think some of the things that we can do um, as individuals, again, and as corporate companies is to develop a sense of community when it comes to climate change impact and create more awareness and create more trainings around it. And I think the world has been talking a lot about, you know, social impact and climate change for the longest time, but you know, what action are you taking? What are you doing as a company that is measurable? And what can you do that is measurable that, you know, can actually produce results? And so, um, you know, I think these, you know, we personally, in, in the personal level at Septima, we, uh, we support companies um, that are, you know, either implementing decentralized technologies or uh, taking action you know, towards climate change impact, and we, we promote the use of the different technologies and hoping that, in, you know, that would lead to partnerships as well. And so what can you do as a company to actually help with those partnerships? Um, so thank you for listening to my um, lovely speech. I'd like to open the floor for any questions that anyone might have since we're approaching the end. Great. Thank you very much, Asma, for your thoughts. 
It's uh, really, really impressive, uh, especially for me, impressive is this uh, decentralized technologies. It's a great potential and uh, it's uh, responding to many needs uh, in, in the environment that we are observed. And uh, my question is regarding Thank this. Thank you very much, Asma, for your thoughts. It's uh, really, really impressive, uh, especially. Uh, in in the environment that we are observed. Okay, I'm sorry. We have here some technical problems. Uh, can you hear me, Asma? Yes, I can hear you. You're fine. Great, thank you. Okay, so uh, again, uh, thank you for this. Uh, thank you for this uh, sharing your your experiences and and thoughts. Uh, I am especially impressed by the uh, decentralized technologies. It's really really something new. And uh, my question is about the the action plan. Uh, which part of the action plan you think is the most challenging? Is it the first stage or or the uh, two last elements. What are your thoughts? Yeah, let me bring that up real quick so that everybody can see it. So I think that the most challenging, Jan, would be uh, the assess portion because the very first step is always the, the hardest. <laughs> Even as a child, right, the first step is the hardest step. But um, I think the most the most challenging one is assess because uh, that's the point where you have to really look at your company and look at all the elements, everything you're doing from from the moment you switch on your laptop, you're using electricity, right? From that point, you know that that's an assessment you have to capture. I mean, that's a that piece of data you have to capture. How much electricity do I use per month? How much water do we consume? Um, those are the, the littlest things, um, and, and that has to be captured. And I think people don't understand how important that is. Like, for instance, you know, last month I was looking at, you know, how many gallons of water I, I, I consume in my house. And I was like, I screamed, like, I was like, oh my God, we consume thousands of gallons per month. And I was telling my kids, I'm like, you guys need to stop having bubble baths, you know, stop, no more bubble baths. So it's like, so, so it's really the assessment. Only once a week. Point. Yeah, <laughs> really the assessment point that um, is the hardest because it's just it's very rigorous, intense process that involves a lot of data. But you mean intense in case of uh, collecting data or yeah, in, in terms of collecting, analyzing them, collecting the data, but identifying the actions that you you take every day, even on a corporate level that impact the climate. Like I said, you know, use of water, just the amount of water we drink or use. Um, people waste a lot of water and uh, the electricity that we consume, you know, and then how much we recycle, um, all these things. And then that's just the environmental portion of it. You have to think about the social portion of it as well. You know, are we all inclusive? You know, do we, um, are we, you know, do we promote equality? You know, are we, do we have a very, um, is our social environment in the office, for instance, is it, okay, is it good for the health of our people? Right. So those are all the things, you know, mentally and physically. So, again, I think the assessment portion is, is the most rigorous part of it. Mm -hmm. OK, um, there we have a question from the audience. Um, the question is, which of the sustainable development goal do you think is most relevant relevant to the next five years? What can individuals do to contribute to achieving it? Well, I, 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 I thank you for that question. Um, I cannot choose <laughs> because the UN will come after me. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Um, but I think that um, on a, I think not just one is is very important. I think they're they're all very important. But um, I think the ones that really focus on, um, you know, zero hunger, um, and I think also affordable and clean energy. That's number two and number seven, of course, and number six, because you need clean water too. But 
Uh, number two and number, number seven, I would pick because, um, you know, clean energy is very important because without energy, we can't really do anything. Um, we can't mm -hmm. even cook our food. Yes. You know, sure. So, so energy is what important. can individuals do for, to contribute to achieving so, this So um, from an individual level, there's so many things you can do. There's so many things you can do. You can, because it, it's all like, you know, it's all a ripple effect. It's all an ecosystem. It's It's all holistic. So what you do as an individual impacts a lot of other people, if you use less water or just be conscious about the amount of water that you use, um, that's one thing that you can do. You can say, okay, well, I, again, I have three bubble baths uh, in, the, in the tub a week. I'm going to reduce it according to Jan. You reduce it to one. That way I don't have to waste so much water. Um, if you could recycle more, if you could just, you know, use less plastic, you know, go and, and switch to, to other, there are other options. You know, you don't have to buy plastic all the time. You don't have to use plastic all the time. Um, you know, using less paper, becoming more digital, becoming more electronic. Um, you know, IBM actually um, has these paintings that you can buy and put inside your house and they reduce, they suck out the carbon in, in your home and you can reduce the carbon in the air. Um, so there's, there's so much, you know, switch to a, an electric vehicle if you don't already have one. Mm -hmm. So there's just so many because transportation is one of the is, is one of the largest pr producers of carbon, you know, fossil fuels in the air. And, and so, you know, tra the transportation sector is a big, big, you know, don't if you fly a lot, you know, no, no offense to the, you know, the, the airline industry, but <laughs> maybe, you know, try to reduce that a little bit as well. Um, mm -hmm. The more we fly, yeah, you know, I know the, the airline industry is switching to hydrogen at some point. From my perspective, also another question. What could be the contribution of experts, of people who have knowledge, who are uh, from academia, from education and so on? What can you share? Yeah, so from, from the education perspective, I just, you know, and I, and I said, like I said earlier, training is one thing that is, is very, um, we're very short on. We're not doing enough of that. I think that, you know, people need to expose, uh, you know, and from an education perspective, we need to do more to train people and educate people about climate change impact. We need to do more. There has to be some kind of awareness campaigns attached to education to the education academic sector to really promote the education of the impact of climate change and an action plan that people can take easily. I think, you know, people just like, like you, they had, there was a question on what do I do, right? If you want to lose weight, you know that I'm going to stop eating and I just need to exercise and I'm going to lose weight. But if you want to help the climate, you have to start thinking about, oh, what, what can I do? But it's, it's, you can do a lot. But the thing about it is the education and the knowledge is not there for people to take on easily. And the policies and the incentives are not in place to attract people to do these things. And so the education sector plays a very big role in actually helping mm -hmm. a lot through promotion of knowledge and, and, and creating awareness around it. Okay. The participant, uh, Agnieszka Franiak, uh, thanks for your answer. Uh, so me too. Thank you very much. Asma, we are really thankful for that you spent with us this hour and share your knowledge, your experiences uh, and ideas. And what is also important for us, examples of certain uh, technologies and competences that are important in this, uh, in this way to the uh, sustainable future. Thank you, Jan. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me today. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye bye. So uh, we finished uh, today's uh, sessions. You're welcome for tomorrow to have uh, more and new uh, inspirations, uh, knowledge and uh, discussions. Uh, from the morning, we will start with the uh, role of experts in uh, setting long-term goals for country, uh, for central institutions. And uh, also there will be a discussion regarding technology uh, in uh, dedicated to hydrogen. And uh, tomorrow's uh, day, the, uh, the last uh, keynote speaker uh, will be Michał Kurtyka, uh, who will summarize up uh, COP26. 
uh, he is really a dedicated person for this uh, subject because he was a president of COP24 that were held in Poland in Katowice three years ago. Uh, so uh, Michał Kurtyka, who uh, almost a month ago was a minister of uh, environment, will uh, share with us these thoughts. So you're really welcome for tomorrow. Uh, thank to you all for today. And I hope this knowledge and uh, uh, new ideas that came up today uh, will uh, make our uh, society and, and economy a step forward to uh, sustainable future. Thank you very much.